Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode three, and my name is Christopher Bailey, your host. This week, I talk with Brett Slatkin, the author of Effective Python. We talk about the revisions he made for this second edition of his book, updating it for the newest versions of Python 3, and who is the intended developer for the book. We also talk about his work on Google App Engine and using Python at Google scale. There's a brief anecdote about working with Guido Van Rossum, and we also talk about maintaining a large, aging code base. So let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. Interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Brett. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. I know this seems kind of redundant since you were just on Real Python and you're talking about your background, but why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got into programming? Oh, sure. Yeah. I've been programming for a long time. I uh, started around 10 years old, had had done some logo in elementary school and then ended up doing some Lego stuff and then finally got into C, programming with C. And I was really lucky to just have a lot of computers around in my life growing up. And so I had access to that stuff and I got to really take advantage of it. And then, yeah, through from elementary school, junior high, and then into high school and college, I just kept kind of doing side projects and hacking on things, going to take some classes at the city college, and then eventually majoring in computer engineering and doing a lot more programming. So it's it's really just a long, been programming for a very long time. Don't really remember a time I wasn't and something I love to do. Cool. When did Python come into that? Yeah. So it's kind of a funny story uh, since Python is such a big part of my working life and life in general. I had in college, come across the BitTorrent client, which was just kind of getting popular at the time. It was written in Python, and I was checking it out to see what source code was like. And I thought it was it was all it was all written in Python as open source at the time. And yeah, I just I thought it was super ugly <laughs> language. I, I really didn't like <laughs> sure. the look of it. Yeah, I didn't like the the dunder methods and all that kind of stuff. And but I got to take a look, another look at it. So a few years later, I ended up coming to Google for work. You know, my intention was to be a C plus plus programmer in infrastructure. And I ended up being a Python programmer in infrastructure. And so it kind of just worked itself out there. And so my first day was, uh, hey, by the way, you're going to work on this Python code base and here's a book and, you know, go learn and here are all these things you need to do. So it's pretty overwhelming. Yeah, it's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, it was intense. But the good news was that the guy who wrote the book, Alex Martelli, who wrote Python in a Nutshell, including the latest edition, uh, he was actually on the team. And so, you know, had a lot of great Python resources like him around to help me learn. So it was really, I was really lucky to be surrounded by great peers and mentors and have access to a lot of other great Python programmers who worked at Google who who understood the best practices. Nice. You said you were working in infrastructure. What would that look like? Sure. Yeah. So Google, they, they've had a lot of computers for a long time. They still do. It's really hard to manage, you know, once you have like, you know, if you have one computer or two computers, it's not so bad, or even like a rack of 10 computers or 40 computers, depending on how dense it is. It's not too crazy, but once you get into thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or whatever the number is now, wow, it just becomes really difficult to keep track of everything. And so not only do you have to track inventory, but you need to you need to be constantly doing physical repairs to the machines because you know maybe RAM only fails at a rate of 0.01%, or I don't remember what the number is, but if you have a million machines or something like that, and it's, it's that rate of, of uh, <laughs> you know, then you have like... There's going to be something daily then. Yeah, there's like thousands of machines every day that have RAM failing. Wow. So that's when people talk about scale. That's really what they mean. Like, oh, this is a scaling problem. It's like, it's like things when it's just at a lower scale, not a problem because it's so rare. Yeah. Yeah. I was working on a lot of tools to enable that to work at scale, like the repairs process, reinstallation of machines, data center turnups, the cluster management tools that go into making modern cloud type data centers possible. You know, a lot of that was and continues to be in Python. Some crazy numbers that I, you know, I don't even remember what it was, but just just the sheer number of machines being reinstalled per second at Google is <laughs> it's like that's, that's like a number. You know, like machines being fixed and rebooted and reinstalled like a new copy of Linux because it was broken. You you have to measure it in um, a per second number as opposed to like a period. So it's pretty crazy. 
Yeah. So there's like a dashboard there that you have like this metric showing the amount of failures and the yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's changed a bunch since I used to work on it. But yeah, that's that, that's kind of what it was. It was just this constant, just things breaking and dying and then having to be replaced. And so th- the other thing that was really cool about it was this, this combination of humans and machines. Like the machines, you try to automate as much as you possibly can, but you really do need physically someone to go in there and swap out parts or to, to move racks or whatever it is. So so there was always a lot of human elements and, and even a UX to that that the software had to keep in mind, which I think is interesting. Even though it's mostly backend or infrastructure type stuff, there's still you have to keep humans in mind as part of your design constraints and, and who you're trying to satisfy. Yeah, totally. As you bring it up, I'm thinking about, okay, is Python a, a great tool for doing that sort of infrastructure work? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was, I think there's like a decision tree that I've, I have in my mind, I've, I've written down somewhere and it's, kind of like what language should i use for my project you know this is flame wars and bike sheds aside right i think that th- there's some simple things you can think about in order to make that decision so for me and i'm curious you know if you have any thoughts on this like your view but to me like the, one of the first decisions is is it a platform thing so like if you're writing an ios app going with swift is probably the right idea right right it's you know you could try to do it with python but and and you know some people try to to cross compile or transpile or other things like that. And they, and it works sometimes, but same thing, Android, the number of boundaries, there are going to be less, right? Yeah. Yeah. You kind of want to go with the flow with a lot of the platforms. So, you know, same thing with like, if you're making a game, maybe you want to use C sharp or C plus plus just because the platform SDKs you need to use, that's what they're in. Okay. Platform aside, then you get down to like these performance questions. And so to me, there's like really three, three kind of performance questions, which is like, there's latency there's IO and there's kind of memory usage. And if you really do care a lot about latency performance, like if you can't afford a GC pause, then a language like C++ or Rust or one of these other kind of non-garbage collected languages that's super close to the metal, that's kind of the way you want to go because you can't afford even a real-time system that's managing a, an airplane or something like that. You just can't afford GC pauses. Okay. Go is a bad fit. Python's a bad fit. But for IO bound, if you're purely IO bound, and you don't care a lot about CPU overhead or latency, then like Python's like an ideal language. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so that's my view. And so like, so this these systems for managing data centers are like perfect for Python because it's super flexible and you can be very effective. But it's it's a mostly an I/O bound problem. You've worked on a variety of different projects there because I know it might be a long list. Maybe just describe like one of your favorite projects you've worked on at Google. Sure. One of the most fun things I've done uh, at Google, there was a project called PubSub Hubbub, which was it's over a decade now. So that's you know what, what it is. Back in the day when RSS was a thing, uh-huh. you know we were wor- working on making RSS as fast as as Twitter and and feel very real time. So uh, Brad Fitzpatrick and I built out this new protocol and the kind of hub, the relaying system that went with it. It was a ton of fun. It was written in Python on App Engine. It scaled to thousands of requests a second and millions of sites, tons of subscribers. It's it's still live today and actually being used by a lot of people. The, the infrastructure has been rewritten tons of different times, but, uh, or sorry, the infrastructure has been re, uh, rewritten and then like all the traffic's been migrated multiple times, but it's still alive. And, uh, but we had just a lot of fun getting off the ground and, and moving fast to, to get it working. Yeah. I loved Google Reader back in the day and, and using RSS. Yeah. I still have Flipboard and I play with it a bit, but I feel like it's a little hobbled a little bit <laughs> Yeah, as of late, trying to figure out like a good replacement for it. Yeah. I mean, News Blur was a great reader, um, still still around as an RSS reader. I think that just in general, the ecosystem has continued to just die. Uh, it, it's cool seeing Mastodon you know, rise up and kind of fill some of the gap, and at least in terms of personal updates. But yeah, I think that those times when Google Reader was still around, or it's going to, I don't know if we'll ever have those times again. It was so special. Yeah. The guy who does Newswire has done a new version, which is intriguing. Oh, cool. And has some some nice uses there. But I was looking at your website and you've mentioned that you spent some time with uh, Lobster, which I was not familiar with. Yeah. Which is kind of an interesting site for learning news in the programming space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Lobster is a great site. It's if you feel that Hacker News is not technical anymore, which is how I felt about four years ago, it's a great place to go <laughs> instead. That was when you shifted? Yeah, it was like maybe five years ago. Yeah, I think Hacker News is now like a weird, it's like, the, I don't know if you've ever seen the magazine Monocle, which is really interesting, uh-huh. but not a technical. Yeah. You know, and it's, 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 it's more of a lifestyle um, website than a technical website now. So there's still lots of technical content, don't get me wrong, but I just think that it's too hard to sift through it. So I really like Lobsters for all the technical content. So a lot of people that are saying, you know, I'm into development, but they're not 
truly. Yeah, or maybe it's shifted to be more focused on startups and startup culture and business problems. So it's not. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that it's bad. It's just that it's different. And I, I wanted more technical content, more like Reddit programming or something like that. And so Tet Lobsters, I think, feels a lot like Hacker News originally did to me. Oh, cool. How did you start getting into writing books? You've now done two editions of Effective Python. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I've always been a big fan of programming books, um, especially the Effective series. I've Love to blog about things, you know, for over a decade now, far longer. And then I, I was a TA a lot in school. So I, I do enjoy like education and helping people learn things. So I already had kind of a natural interest in it. I also really liked giving technical talks, both within Google and also outside at PyCon and other conferences. And so just kind of along the way, it just so happened that the, the publisher Pearson that publishes effective C++, they, they actually reached out to me and said, Hey, we're going to, we want to write a Python book. Do you want to do this? And I said, that's amazing. Cause of course I do. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it just kind of fell on my lap. I'm, I'm so lucky. Cause if I had known they were looking, I would have totally tried to get the role. And it was, I had just been thinking about writing a book on some kind of related topics anyway. So, so just really like the stars line, I really got lucky there and stoked to do it. I love that when that happens. That's so cool. Yeah. Super lucky. And then, yeah. So the first edition was, you know, four or five years ago, the second edition just came out last fall. It's just a real, real fun experience writing both of those. And I could go on and on about that. Yeah. So who's the intended developer for the effective Python book? Yeah. So I would say if you've read a beginner book and then you You've done some coding projects, you know, you've scratched your own itch, you've written, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of lines of Python to the point where you've started to hurt in certain ways, like, oh man, like this is tough. Like, I don't know how to work through a class hierarchy or modules working with each other, or I don't know how to collaborate with another person. I think, I think you start feeling these natural limitations in your knowledge with Python once you actually start using the tool a lot. And that's like the perfect time to, to pick up effective Python. I think if you just finish your beginner book and now you're, you're like, okay, I finished that. And now I, I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to keep learning. I, I would wait. I think you, you have to have written a, quite a bit of Python code to, to start really understanding the, a lot of the rationale. Okay. If you're still so new, yeah, I think it's worth taking some time to, to like use Python. So I'd say like read your beginner book, then go hack on things for a few months and then pick up a book like a, Effective Python to, to kind of like hone your skills. It's also like the point of Effective Python is that you can jump around. So you're not supposed to read it straight through. So that's another thing that if if you're not sure whether or not it's relevant to you, you kind of look at the item titles and say, oh yeah, I've hit that problem with dictionaries before. I wonder how I should solve that. So I think it's kind of this sweet spot where you can start looking for advice that's relevant to what you're currently doing or problems you're hitting. So that I'd say if, you, if you're not sure where you fit on that spectrum, go look at the, the list of items and, and see which of them actually speaks to you and your experience. If none of them do, then maybe write some more code. I was thinking about that. It's an interesting structure. I'm guessing that's the structure that was a setup in the effective series in general. Yeah, that's like Scott Myers. That was his kind of his novel approach to programming education, essentially, was this structure of book. I think of it as like these topics that are sort of advice statements. Each one has like a heading of like, know this, prefer that over this or avoid. What's the benefit of writing in that style? Yeah. So Scott Myers actually wrote a, a blog post called Effective Effective Books, where it's like an effective <laughs> guide to writing an effective book, which is pretty funny. Great. So I can send you a link to that. But And so essentially it's like, take a stand is his advice, which is like, you should have an opinion. It's like, it's not enough to just describe what is available. Because if people want to know what's available, they, they can just read the source code, or they can read the developer documentation or the tutorial. What they want to know is the hard won from experience, like, you know, just because the, the feature exists doesn't mean you should use it. Or yes, there's only one way to do it in Python, perhaps, but, you know, ultimately there are many ways to do it. So what's the right way based on experience? Cool. So I think that's the main thing is trying to really say like, he actually has a, a scale of it's, you know, always do this, which is implied. So just, you don't ever see the word always prefer this, consider that, avoid something or never, literally never do this. Yeah. But there's also like know how to do X, Y, and Z is, kind of like just a more informational one when it's like, don't forget, like just a note of a kind of a small topic that you might have not realized is important to, to be aware of. And keep this in your tool belt. Make sure that you right. are comfortable with this. Yeah, exactly. Cool. The first book came out in 2015. Is that right? Yeah. In this rewrite, a lot of the changes in code at the time you were doing some in Python 3, but this book is almost entirely in Python 3, hence the end of life with Python 2 in January. Right. Were there sections that you were excited to rewrite in the new book? Yeah. So the new book's entirely Python 3. There's no Python 2 in there at all. Okay. So that's that was great <laughs> to, to, to shed that. 
Uh, that's that's a Python joke. Um, anyway, <laughs> so the, the uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is I had nothing on async IO in the original uh, book. And I think a lot of people were excited about that in Python 3. There's a big focus that Guido had for a while. You know, so I think that was something I was excited to do is to rip out a bunch of the old generator send and throw behavior, the old, the way you used to do coroutines. In the original book, item 40 was this whole game of life that I wrote using generator coroutines. And it's, it's like my favorite part of the first book. And it's funny because now it's totally irrelevant because you should just use async functions and async IO instead. So that was just a complete change in the advice and the tools available because of the evolution of Python. So that, that was really excited to do that. The other ones I can think of were the typing module. The whole concept of gradual typing and types being added to Python was such a such a remote concept five years ago. I mean, people had talked about this and that, and there were type annotations, the pep for that a very long time ago, but it never had really come into its own. And then with MyPy and, and you know the adoption of that by Dropbox and, and Guido's effort on that, it's really become something that's a key part of um, large-scale Python. Again, large-scale meaning like a lot of code, like millions and millions of lines and thousands and thousands of, of developers on the same code base. So typing is interesting because it's cross-cutting. Typing is relevant to not just interfaces, but you know correctness and testing. And so Typing has its own element uh, or item in the book. I think it's item 90, but it's also sprinkled into a few other of the items in there because it's like, oh, you can solve it this way or that way. And typing is, if you are using typing, then typing is actually a great solution to this problem. Yeah. So I was really excited to, to add that dimension. Yeah. I did a, a video course recently on Real Python based on one of my previous guests, Garon Yella's article. It dives deep into you know typing and kind of this idea that you can gradually get into it, which is kind of cool. And a lot of the advantages you mentioned, you know, a lot of interfacing, but also if you're going to share code or it's going to be put in a repository, it's sort of this documentation tool also. Totally. Um, that can really, really help, you know, <laughs> explain what's going yeah. on with your code. And Totally. I mean, there's so many different aspects of it, of why it's beneficial. I mean, for small projects or, or you know, ad hoc analysis to tasks, like it's not a good fit, but for any kind of infrastructure work, especially the, the bottom of a dependency tree, it's really just super valuable. I was thinking about at Google, you probably have lots of annotations <laughs> throughout your code then. It's growing. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say we're like late to the party, but definitely it's such a huge code base that it's a much more difficult thing to migrate. Okay. Uh, we also have really good test coverage because we haven't had these annotations for a long time. Mm. Uh, and what they did also is that they backported annotations to Python 2. So that the, and that patch is available to open source. So if you are still stuck using Python 2, I think Google has the patch out there. So it basically lets you add Python, like MyPy style, Python 3 style annotations and use tools like MyPy on Python 2 source code, which makes it easier to actually migrate from Python 2 to Python 3. It's more like a type comment kind of thing? Well, yes, um, for variables, but which I think was the case for Python 3 before it maybe is Python 3.5. But the actual syntax, like in the argument list and return value for type annotations, it's been there since I think it's like Python 2. Two, two, six. Okay. Yeah. So it's actually been there for a really long time and it was used for other purposes in the past, various performance projects like unladen swallow and some of these old terms, but, but yeah, so that, that's actually already supported. It's more like the, the variable annotations and I think some of the other, uh, the actual typing module itself and, the, and those types, I think that's what they brought back in. I'm not actually sure exactly what is the full extent of the port, but I think the point is that you can use syntax that looks like modern Python three. Yeah and then get all the the nice typing goodness out of it. All the benefits coming with it. Yeah. Cool. The other thing I was going to say about the, um, in terms of things I was excited about with the, the new book was just meta classes. I think that like meta classes have completely changed in modern Python. In Python 2, you had to do a lot of stuff with overloading like under, under, new, and just all kinds of weird craziness to get nice meta class behavior. And they so there's kind of like black magic that you would just it was kind of more like an incantation that you would use not understanding how it works but you know it does okay modern python has init subclass and set name which basically solves like 90 percent of these they're 90 99 of these cases so you almost never need to build the meta class anymore so in the past it's like meta classes were the last thing you needed to like put the capstone on your python education and now it's like you don't even need to know that meta classes are a thing uh, which is really cool so I think that I was really excited to simplify because I think it's easier to understand simpler concepts. So if you're going to explain that change as far as like, okay, this was a meta class back in the day um, compared to what we're doing now, how would you explain that to like, say, an intermediate developer? Yeah, so it's the same thing like where if you have a class with a parent class, 
and you know that you call super init to initialize the parent class. Okay. Pretty simple concept. I think once you get into like class hierarchies, yep. it's the same concept, but it's init subclass instead. Instead of initializing an instance of the object, it's initializing a class. So if so, every time you define a subclass, it's going to call this chain of parent super uh, methods. So you know if you have a shape class and then you have a circle class, it's inheriting from it. The shape class will get a call to init subclass when circle is defined, and it'll get to do something, modify the class in some way, customize it, whatever, whatever it needs to do. Any of the weird validation, any any of the weird use cases that you might want to do. You just so you just overload the method and it just magically works. Cool. And you know, stack traces make sense. Like all these, it's very easy to you can run a debugger on it. You know, it's just really and you could before, but it was kind of like, wait, what is getting called and where? And it was really confusing. So now it's really it's very obvious how things are working. Nice. You even have some Python three eight recent stuff inside the book. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, Walrus operator being the biggest the biggest thing there. I think that that's a huge change, and I, I, I'm a big fan of it. I think it really simplifies a lot of repetitive code. So yeah, that's one of the big Python 3.8 changes that's that's in there. I was looking through the book and going through your website, and one of the example chunks or sections that you share is about using the Walrus operator, kind of having it perform a bit of a switch case type statement. I thought that was really cool because right. that, that's something I learned Swift, trying to learn a little bit about game programming on iOS. And that you know, was something that was there, and I've seen it in a few other languages sql and other kind of stuff like that so i was like oh, how do we do this in in python yeah i would see the kind of structures you were showing before this like really nested if <laughs> structure and i was impressed with like okay this is kind of a neat way to, to accomplish that thanks yeah i mean it's it was so awful before and i think you'd see talk about code smells you'd see python code written in a certain style to try to eliminate levels of nesting on if statements because there was no switch statement. And so I understand Python's trying to be simple and say there's only one way to do it. And you know, that, that's great. But yeah, like the switch statements are actually pretty nice to have. It's not the best like if you have like a you know hundred line switch statement, that's probably not a good idea. Right. You know, often like a switch statement with like four branches, pretty useful. There's like if, if, if else if, and then else. Like, you know, I think a few branches, like it's, you know, yes, you could refactor it and be even smaller, but I think that's generally useful. So I think the walrus operator finally gives us a nice, a pithy way to do that where essentially you put an assignment in each branch of the if statement. So, you know, do an assignment and then compare it to something. And then else if, do an assignment and compare it to something. And so that that do an assignment is kind of the evaluate the expression and then compare it to something. And that's how you get that kind of waterfall of evaluation that's available in in other switch or case statements in other languages. Yeah, it's pretty slick. It's a really great exemplary use of the Walrus operator, you know. I've seen other ones where it's just like kind of like a tutorial, like, well, you could do this with it. But I, I really see like a very handy use in these types of statements where it's like, okay, creating that assignment and then you're using it like immediately, which is cool. Yeah, and there's, and there's performance implications of that as well because you then, and that's the same in other languages, you're making sure that when you do that, they're evaluated in order so that you know you're not, you can put the most expensive one, you know, at the bottom, put the fast path first and then put the expensive check at the bottom. So there's some nice performance behaviors of that as well. You did this interview with Ricky, which I mentioned before, and on it you were talking about as you were switching from being the C++ person to by default now being a Python programmer, and you felt that you gained a lot of productivity through that and it was fairly dramatic. What is it that made it more productive for you? I would say the thing that made me like the, the biggest boost in productivity, there's kind of two parts to it. The okay. first one was just the run edit test loop. You know, with C or Java, you're kind of you're making a change to the file, you're saving the file, you're rerunning the build system, and then you and then you're running it. You know, your program or your tests, and then you're seeing if it works, and you're doing it again and again. I feel like the the loop there. I think you know with tools like Go that are super fast compiling, it's gotten a lot better. But uh, even if you hear like read about you know how Rust programmers are dealing with things these days, it's like you know super long compile times. You know a company like Google where you have huge amounts of infrastructure, you're linking your binary against pretty big targets just to bring in all the the substrate. So I think Python often kind of hot loads or can very quickly boot up essentially, and there's no compilation step because just launching the program is compilation. Right. Kind of does it as it goes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think just like the speed at which you can iterate in that edit test loop is was really nice, and I think it better fit how I I want to I want to you know I'm, I'm impatient and I want to be quickly rewarded for my my efforts. Uh, <laughs> sure. So that's one. I mean, I, I think yeah. So like it's so it might be slow once it's executing, but at least it's running. Right, and you you've tried 
a handful of things where in the meanwhile, something else was compiling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And 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 you'll actually hear about people like hardcore Lisp people from back in the day, you know, they'll talk about how even what Python's doing is kind of a joke compared to Lisp. Like Lisp, what you could do is you could, while you're running the program, see that it's giving a bad result for something, pause the whole program, modify a function. And because of, you know, the fact that it's all functional and can whatever that uh, substitution principle is, like you can you can just continue running the program after changing a function wow. and like nothing happened, you know, uh, the Liskov substitution principle or whatever that is. And so, yeah, so I think like, so I'm, I'm sure there's something that the Lispers would say that I'm still missing, but I, I feel like yeah, from going from C++ and Java to Python, it, it was just it felt like a dramatic change in terms of the, the turnaround time to, to edits. Yeah, that's cool. I, I think of that like uh, one of the reasons I got into the Apple ecosystem was I was working at a school for recording engineers and this other engineer there was just telling me about logic and he was showing me the logic program and I was like, oh, I have that, but I don't understand it. And he basically said, okay, let me sit down and show you a couple things. And I sort of fell in love with it. And part of it was that you could be editing while it's playing, modifying notes, changing things, changing things and moving them around. And that's cool. That sort of real time ability. Whereas almost every other program that I'd worked up to at that point in the nineties and right about 2000, it was very modal. Okay. Stop. Now you're editing. Now you change this thing. You know, you play again. Yeah, and this is like getting back to a lot of Brett Victor's uh, kind of views on programming and creativity and, and games and programming in general. So the, the distance between making changes and yeah and seeing them should be as minimal and short as possible. It's a very very similar kind of view. Yeah, yeah. The, and then the second the second thing that I feel where the productivity came from was. And I'll find a link to this for you, but uh, I didn't come up with this. I got to give credit to somebody else. But essentially, this concept of like with C plus plus, you really have two or three mental models that you have to have in your head. Okay, one is just an understanding of like the compiler and how it works, and how templating and metaprogramming works, and the the macro system. And so, C plus plus as a language is not enough to actually debug a C plus plus program. Like you have to understand the compiler, the multiple phases of the compiler, the, and how they interact with each other. And then for debugging, you know, you have to understand stack frames and all, you know, memory layouts and all these things. And so you, there's many languages you have to actually use and you have to switch between modes in your head mm. of what is going on and when one, one thing or another. And in Python, you don't have that. There's just Python. Like the program starts and it starts to run and everything it's doing is just Python code doing stuff. And so it's like, oh, a class being defined? Well, that's just this function being called and then being assigned this name. And you know, an attribute being accessed? Well, that's just this dictionary being referenced and that value being returned. And so debugging and writing a program and debugging a program are the same type of mental activity. <laughs> yeah. When other languages, they are not. <laughs> okay. And that's the big thing. So I think that's huge for beginners and to become productive it makes code easier to maintain over time it makes it just much more approachable as a language someone might say it's not as powerful for that reason but i think that's the main thing is like you just have to learn python and that's the only thing the only tool you really need to be productive right that's awesome you mentioned a couple of times that you've worked with guido there at google i don't know what that time frame was what was your experience working with him yeah, so it was like 2007 through 2009 or 2000, yeah, like end of 2006 through 2009, 2010. Okay. So about four years there. He was on the App Engine team when I was on the App Engine team. Yeah, he, I mean, he's a really awesome guy, really nice guy, very thoughtful. He's got a really good sense of humor, um, which I guess you'd expect given that Python's named after Monty Python, he'd have a sense of humor, but right. <laughs> he does. Uh, he's a funny guy. He likes to have a good time and joke about things. I think that, I mean, I learned a lot from him. I think that there's, what I what I learned from him that I do use the most, the knowledge I use the most. Sure, that sounds awesome. Well, you know, one thing that's crazy is when you sit next to someone who's really good <laughs> watching them work. Yeah. The opposite of this is when someone who's really good sits down and watches you work, oh, which boy. is like super scary. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the other way is pretty cool. So I sat down, you know, as we were debugging something, and and I was watching him do something, you know, work on his computer, and I'm just sitting next to him, and you know, he's using his terminal and Emacs, and you know, he's he's got a lot of experience using these tools, and. You know, we were, he was trying to figure out this command line to do something and, you know, adding switches and changing arguments and all these things. And he's like, I'm not sure if this is exactly what I want to run. And I think like at that time, maybe I would have copied it into a buffer, the command. But what he did was he, he did, you know, control A to go to the head of the line in his shell. And then he inserted a hash character, like a comment, and then he pushed return. And so he basically said, I'm going to put this in my bash history so I can get it again, but I'm going to make it a comment so it doesn't do anything. And 
like in hindsight, that's so obvious, and you see it in every shell script. We oh, don't comment out that line. Don't don't run that. But the fact that he used it as a per, like a personal memory pad built into the shell. I had been using Unix and Linux for like over a decade. I'd literally never seen anyone do that. He did it. And now it's like, of course people do that all the time, but like I had never known that. And now I do that all the time. Like if you look at my history of my command line, it's like more than half of what I've written is commented out because I'm just trying to figure out what my next move is going to be and tweaking it. So yeah, I don't know if you if that a, if that's something you've ever done or used um, a style that you've had, but no, that's the first time I ever saw that. That's really cool. Kind of to flip what you were talking about with what you're saying before, I was a trainer for a while, and Mm -hmm. one of the best ways to figure out what's going on, you know, with a student is just to let them do the thing in front of you for a little while. And, you know, like I would see people working with, you know, a laptop or whatever, and it wasn't even necessarily programming, but I would watch them just get frustrated and I could just see what they were doing with their hands and, and so forth. And it was like so enlightening and it's kind of on both sides of it. You know, it's like if you're teaching someone, watching them work for just a moment. And then being able to file off all those rough edges, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah, like a coach. Yeah. That's the, yeah, we, we need uh, Emacs coaches who can watch you and tell you <laughs> what, what you don't know or, or Vim or whatever, whatever key commands. You, there's so much uh, esoteric knowledge there that we, that we could share better. Right. Yeah. That's one of the things I like about the video training stuff too sometimes. I'm just kind of watching somebody work and like a Twitch stream or something. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fun. Totally. What's it been like to work in that same code base for so many years? Yeah, I mean, it's it's like driving a classic car, okay. I think is probably <laughs> what it's like. You know, I, I think uh, I've been working on the same projects for over, over a decade now. They've grown and changed a ton. And the code base is, you know, a million lines of code or something like that. Wow. So it's, 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 a, it's a lot. And so, yeah, I think it's, you know, the, with a classic car, you know, suddenly, you know, you got a lot of rust, you got some <laughs> overspray on the paint, sure. you know, you got, it's a, it's a money pit, you know, there's all this stuff and, but also it's, you know, it's going the distance, it's, it's lasting, it's satisfying, you know, it's, it's beautiful in its own way. It's be- uh, yeah, I, th- I think, I think that that's where the analogy starts to break down because it actually has some utility. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think, I think it's mostly like being willing to reflect and say, Hey, here's what we did right. You know, here's what, here's what we did wrong. Here's how the world's changed underneath us. You know, one example of this was when I, I started this project, only 76% of American adults were online. Okay. And now that number is like 90%. Yeah. You know, and so, which is still like saying that 10% of the population is not online, which is like a huge number, actually. You know, it's like, you know, 30 million people or whatever. So I think code has to, code must live. It is an organism, you know, mm-hmm. and it's changing over time based on where it is and, and it's the environment around it. So I think, I think it's just been interesting to see how much of the codes rot and changes are like a, a product of the world changing or the fact that the, you know, the needs have changed or, you know, all these different factors. I think that's just, you know, the frameworks have changed, performance characteristics have, uh, characteristics have changed, the number of cores available has changed, like so much has changed in different dimensions. Okay. So I think just seeing that and then evolving a code base with that, that's been really interesting and paying down technical debt and moving onto different infrastructure. I think that's been just really enlightening because there's like, oh, I'll never do it that way again. Or <laughs> I realize like dependency management is like the most important problem to solve. Like, you know, like making sure that you have the minimal number of dependencies with the clearest interfaces. I know everyone will always say that this is the thing that you need to do and every book says it and so on, but to really fully appreciate what happens if you don't do that, you know, in a, in a spaghetti code base, you know, yeah. is, is a good way to learn. So it's not that bad of a code base, don't get me wrong, but you know what I'm saying? It's just like, sometimes you have to see things with your own eyes to really appreciate the advice you've gotten and the wisdom you've heard. Yeah, you, you mentioned the term rot there. Can you go into what you mean by that? A little bit. I, I know you already mentioned some of it, but sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really just like that code eventually doesn't work the way you intended it to, and it's it can be a, a combination of factors from the machine and infrastructure changing, assumptions changing at the product level, users, privacy landscape is a big thing that's changing right now, laws that go with that. So I think it just I think that all code has a shelf life. So I think if you are making a project that's built to last, I think you should always assume that everything needs to be rewritten or deleted after some amount of time. Or else it becomes a liability. And I think a lot of the technical debt conversations people have, they think of it as more of like technical debt is like you had an accelerant that lets you ship something mm. and now you have to like deal with that accelerant to maintain as opposed to, hey, this is a thousand year old building that we're trying to maintain, like, you know, the 
Tower of London or something like that. You know, that's it's a different. It's, it's, so I think it's more like the Tower of London case where it's not really an accelerant. It's more like this is just like a classic car. It's an old building. It's it's a bridge. It's a thousand years old. It's just you know it's serving a purpose, but it needs to be constantly improved and and have its pieces replaced and re- redone. Right. You need it to keep running, but continue to fix the elements that are showing problems and yeah. And completely replace them. Yep. And update them to deal with the new laws and things you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it's like the, the back to the future car getting, you know, getting a fusion reactor and, you know, the ability, ability to fly. Like it just, you know, <laughs> has to change as the requirements evolve over time. You know, it's yeah same car, but you know, all the parts have been swapped out. Totally. You had done this refactoring talk at PyCon, and I think you were mentioning partway into that, that you were interested in maybe at some point looking at a, a book that would be on refactoring that would be like a Python refactoring book. I know that may not be on your plate right now because you just finished writing this book, but let's imagine you were going to do that. What would be the first thing you'd put in that refactoring book for Python? Yeah. Yeah. I think about this a lot because I think it's, it's really relevant to the day to day of being a programmer. I would say, like, just to think inside your own head, you know, what is the thing you fear the most in your programming projects? And I think that okay. one thing that I think people I've heard is renaming things. Like everyone agrees naming is hard, mm. but names like bad names stay around for a long time. Right. So I think the ability to rename classes, functions, files, modules, module hierarchy, relationships between modules, that is because th- those are the really key foundations of how software is built, how modules relate to each other, dependencies are managed, how things feel to you as a developer using an API, building on the foundation of, of functionality. So I, I, I'd say like that's probably where I would start is just helping people understand how to like move from one structure of the code to another structure of the code, mostly like modules. Like how do you rename a module or a file or, or the classes within it? I think that that's yeah. just starting with names. I'm not even saying pulling, extracting out functionality, but just like, I want to move, you know, I have the utils.py file and I've got the utils2.py file and I've got the helpers.py file. And, you know, how do I get from here to math.py and, strings.py or you know what i mean it's i think that you 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 know you need to do that kind of cleanup for the sake of approachability but people just never get around to it so you end up having like 15 utility class utility files and yada 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 so i think i think that to help people quickly reorganize code would be where i'd want to start that's awesome these are some questions that i'm kind of developing as like ongoing questions for the podcast yeah and so one of the ones i was thinking about is what is something that you thought about you understood in python but it turned out you were wrong about it yeah, I I think that um, I, yeah, for me that one is I thought that function calls and attribute accesses were fast. Okay, like I, I you know coming from C plus plus where it's like zero um, zero overhead abstractions, I'm like oh yeah, like I'll just refactor that into an attribute or I'll make that a little function. It's like it turns out that the like worst performance things you can do in Python include function calls and attribute accesses and objects. Oh wow. And so yeah, so if you care about performance, mm-hmm. making code like well structured actually undermines the performance of what you're doing. And that can really surprise you and it sucks. <laughs> so I think that <laughs> Yeah, you're like this looks so much better, <laughs> but it performs worse. Y- yeah, like this is so easy to understand and it's easy to test and it's like this is th- literally a thousand times slower than it used to be. Wow. And that, there was a at a time I was modifying the protocol buffer compiler within Google trying to overcome some of these limitations because it, it was so slow, you know, and I ended up making it, you know, much, much faster. Um, this is for some stuff I did on App Engine. But yeah, it's just, I think that's like, just coming from any other language, you'd be like, oh yeah, I'll just do this. This is like, you know, I'm trying to make my code easy to read, right? It's for humans. The compiler, surely a sufficiently, you know, <laughs> intelligent compiler will do the right thing. It's like, nope. So that that to me is, yeah, you gotta, you gotta be really careful. That's great. What's something that you're excited about in the world of Python right now? Again, this could be like a, an event that's coming up or a, a package or a coding tool or hardware. Yeah, I think I'm most excited about PEP 554, which is the sub-interpreter's PEP. It's by this guy, Eric Snow, who I don't know, but I've you know heard of him, heard him talking about it and, and seen some of his work. And, and so it's essentially, it's kind of like Dart. Um, the Dart language is isolates. It's multiple threads of control that can pass objects across some kind of memory management layer boundary. And it has the potential to make Python actually take advantage of multiple cores without any kind of weird Numba or other acceleration type um, tools. I think that if we had that, then Python could really become a powerhouse for many CPU-bound workloads. 
And I think that that's, you know, so my, my, um, dependency graph or decision tree of language choice would definitely change if that actually happened. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. There's a ton of work left to do there, but it looks like it's slowly making progress towards delivering some functionality. I think there's a lot of room there still to influence what it is, the API, et cetera. But I think that, you know, a few years from now, maybe sometime after Python 4 comes out, whatever, whatever the, the schedule is for that, that'll, that'll actually start to arrive. And I, I would love to see how libraries like, you know, NumPy and Pandas and, and, uh, Dask and everything else like takes advantage of that. It'll be really, really cool to see. Would really change the machine learning and yeah, other kind of spaces, right? Yeah, it, it might. I mean, I, I think I think if it's done perfectly, like no one will even know it'll just get faster, you know. But I, of course, that won't happen because it's a, a different mental model. But I think it might. You read a lot of posts like how I ported from Python to X, and I think maybe many of those will go away if we had this. Nice. Do you listen to music when you code? And if so, what what type of music do you listen to? Yeah, so I mean, I, I I used to listen to a ton of music when I was programming for the longest time, like twenty years or whatever. And I think that the at some point I stopped, and it's just because I I end up having so much music in the rest of my life that it's kind of like I, I appreciate the silence now when I write code. So I I used to always listen to like listening to a lot of jazz, okay, like Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, uh, Joe Beam, like a lot of these kind of classic '50s '60s type jazz uh, musicians. But then when I'm programming, yeah, I'm just like, I prefer like just silence. It's it's great. And I think it's weird because the kind of stereotypical programmer has like their headphones on and they listen to, you know, some kind of crazy electronic music, which is like totally what I did before. But now, uh, yeah, I kind of, I, I don't know if I grew out of it or I just, I just really appreciate the silence now. It helps me focus. That uh, makes sense. Um, I was talking to one of the other people at Real Python, and he was saying he likes to listen to almost like ambient noise kind of stuff like yeah you know, like like rain or you know ocean or you know some other kind of thing that is not necessarily you know purely musical but he wants that kind of totally spaciousness that's there yeah i like that a lot yeah i think there's that i think also it's more meditative i mean a lot of programming require i mean i think thinking more and and writing less and doing less often can actually make you faster and it's harder to do that when you're like in the groove just like hacking away at something so so i think yeah to me i found silence to be really helpful to help focus Cool. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. It's been awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, and it's been really fun. I, I'll make sure to get those links to the <laughs> to credit the right people with uh, some of those things. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Have a good one. I want to thank Brett Slatkin for talking with me, and I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player, and if you like the show, leave us a five star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Paling, and I look forward to talking to you soon.